go to P stop. So let's start. Now, I have had presentations on this topic in the past. So yeah, I'm kind of hammering on that <laughs> quite a lot, I suppose. But there have been some developments since the last time that uh, lead me to the uh, conclusion that it's probably a good idea to recap and sh share with you what has changed since then. First, a few words about me. Uh, I have started to work for Clickworks in uh, April 2013 without having any knowledge of FileMaker at all. So that was a, a very interesting step for me and I haven't had a single regret since then. Before I have uh, actually my first serious uh, software development job was uh, creating an ERP system for uh, small to medium businesses in and in a development environment uh, called Open Road. It was a 4G language and it had some interesting challenges. Later, I have worked um, as an industrial software implementer, namely uh, for a company that uh, developed uh, industrial printers. So all kind of, kinds of uh, barcoding, uh, labeling, all that stuff. We made big implementations and integrations for larger clients. It was a very interesting job, and it gave you quite a unique perspective on how computers really uh, have a great job when controlling machines and, and doing all that stuff that we normally don't get into contact in our software development. And that was uh, an SQL Server based environment. So I became quite an expert on developing databases, maintaining them and all, the, all of that stuff. And in my free time, I have been an active softball player. I have actually about 30 years of a career behind me. Um, I have quit now. Uh, I don't mention that just for as a fun fact. It actually has a connection to my next slide because I'm going to show you what happens when things go wrong. So that was a short demonstration of the principle. You can never be too careful. There's no such thing as too much protection. The more safe you want to play it, the better. And still things go wrong. So, sorry. Let's first have a look at some of the main reasons why you would want to use uh, some standard error handling uh, procedures. Now, okay. First of all, standardized error handling, uh, as I say, allows a conceptual solution for critical situations. What it means, um, if you are working on some kind of a procedure and you run into a situation where you see you cannot go on, huh? things have gone wrong, you cannot go on. This provides you with an 
great is means of escape. You just say, okay, I can't go on. I'm calling an error. And it's you don't have to worry about how that situation will be handled because most of the time uh, your procedure did not create that kind of an error. And so you should not be responsible for clearing that. The other advantage of doing that is uh, you don't clutter your business code with too much um, checks. If you do something instead of a lot of checks, is this possible? Is this not possible? You just say, hey, I've got a situation here. Have someone else handle it. That also, if you uh, consistently use error handling and uh, in other languages, they call it exceptions to communicate uh, erroneous uh, statuses of your application, you create a robust code. You, anytime things go potentially wrong, it, it is directly noted potentially if your error handlers are written in a uh, decent way, it gets logged and you have a lot of back, uh, uh, feedback information about uh, what goes wrong in your application, which in turn reduces um, your testing time. If you if uh, the customer reports some kind of a problem, you already have a lot of information ready before you start investiga investigating. Now, this all might seem um, a little bit too much overhead for uh, developments that are pretty much one-man show. And I can perfectly understand that. Huh? If you're the, the only person who makes all uh, of that code, you know how the procedures to communicate with each other. And that it doesn't, it can make little sense to put these things in place. But when you are in a uh, dev development team or when you work on a product, then uh, you have. Uh, a lot more incentive to use uh, the standard uh, error handling procedures. On the other hand, um, it's always a judgment call. What you should do is treat business logic in your code and treat error logic outside your mainstream code. Now, I'm going to give you two examples. Like, let's say you have a script in FileMaker that is designed to run in a browse mode. Mm -hmm. well, you can do two very simple things. If, you, uh, if your code starts to run, you can check, am I in a browse mode? If no, I say, okay, yeah, let's exit. I can't, I can't work here, let's exit. But why was your script actually executed in uh, another mode than browse mode. Most probably because somewhere else there is a mistake. So I would argue that if you run into a situation, uh, if your script is executed in browse mode, you shouldn't just do exit. You should say, hey, this is wrong. Somebody probably uh, have, has put a, a button on a layout and forgot to hide it in a find mode. And that's that's the type of judgment call that you need to make. These are decisions you need to communicate in a team and to get, have a consistent approach. Similar uh, with invoices. If you have uh, invoices that can be, uh, let's say, published only when there are lines, two, two possibilities. You start a script to publish uh, an invoice. Uh, do I have invoice lines? If no, you can say, yeah, exit, I just can't go on. But it's again, probably not the script's fault and someone else made it possible to call your procedure without all the conditions being met. And in that case, again, I would argue you should invoke some error procedure. So this situation is properly communicated to the rest of the application. Now, first of all, Let's have a short look into how other languages implement uh, 
uh, error handling. It's well, yeah, if anyone has comment or whatever, please don't be uh, afraid to jump in. There is every language does it uh, slightly differently, but the main, the mostly used uh, construct is try, catch, finally. When you write your code and you know that things can go wrong from certain point, you enclose your code in a try segment. Hmm? When you do that, you need to define a catch segment after that try and optionally a final segment. It works uh, in the following way. Whenever somewhere inside your try uh, segment, the code executes a throw command. That's pretty much telling to the application, hey, something's wrong, I can't go on. The execution is directly transferred to the catch segment. There, you ideally investigate what type of error this is. You re react properly to the errors that you can handle. And uh, if your error is handled, you uh, handle the execution over to the finalist uh, segment. If there is no final segment, your execution just goes on. If you couldn't handle your error in your catch segment, you would say rethrow exception. What that means, inside your try segment, you can do this whole thing again. It's nestable. So if somewhere in the script two, I again have some kind of a situation that I wanna uh, handle differently, I can put try, catch, finally, right in there. And it will behave exactly the same way. So every error that is thrown, or exception, I will put, bubbles up all the way until it's handled by uh, catchers written by you. Or, and that's uh, a feature of all the languages that use uh, try, catch, finally, it gets handled by the default error handler and it ends up being so-called unhandled exceptions. I, I think we've all already met these in the past. Uh, it, I really believe it would be ideal if FarmAnker provided us with this as a, a standard feature. Now, until that happens, we of course need to come up with uh, some ways to as closely as possible uh, re, um, provide this kind of functionality. Now, does anyone have from this diagram a clue of, yeah, probably, yeah, what is the largest obstacle uh, for a uh, farm maker to implement this type of behavior? Any, any volunteers? Come on, guys. I'm sweating my ass over here uh, doing the presentation. Just give it, give it a shout. Um, basically, any of the uh, when it calls script two, you don't actually know what script doing is to the state of the system, so you end up with um, it's not it's not purely functional. There are side effects that you that you um, you don't necessarily know what's happened. I honestly, the problem issue is that you know. You can only run Maybe, one script um, at a time. That there is no stack uh, that you can ask. Yeah. There's no observability. You can't tell which script called your actual script. So you have to. OK, that's actually not true. And you, I will show you later in this uh, presentation. But you are getting very close. I think you're just not naming it properly. FileMaker doesn't make it possible to transfer execution from the place where you throw an error to some arbitrarily defined catch section. You cannot say, okay, from here, I need to transfer uh, the um, execution to another script higher up in the call stack and a specific uh, location, namely the catch section. All the rest can be pretty much more or less defined in FileMaker. 
Isn't that what you do with a single loop script? Well, that would work for one script, but imagine you have three scripts in your call stack. And in the third script, you say throw error. You need to have all the three scripts that are in the stack equipped with perform script if uh, error exit script. Yeah? So I would disagree I mean, there. <laughs> Sorry. So, okay, how would you do that? Um, we're doing exceptions for quite a while now, and uh, we just return an exception object instead of the expected result. It's a kind of a JSON object, which is called exception, and, and then all the details are inside. And the calling script just checks after each call, checks for the result if it is an ex exception. That's our catch. And if it's Perfect. an exception, that's it just passes it above to the calling script and all the, the call stack uh, to the first um, trigger, uh, it is passed uh, upstairs or uh, up. Yeah, and I, I the, agree the exception. That. Yeah. But even if you use that single loop pass, every perform script has to be followed exit loop if, by exit loop if, I mean. It's, it's not about the single loop script, it's, it's Every yeah. script call, uh, every script that's called, it, um, checks the return if it is an exception, and if uh, if it is, it just uh, returns uh, to the calling script again. I know. It moves, I, it moves up. Yeah. I agree, but you have to design. You have to traverse the path back to the f script where yeah. your text yeah. section is yourself. Yeah. There is no way around that. All the other uh, practices that this diagram shows are possible with FileMaker, except yes. this one. You have to design it yourself, but okay, perfect. Thanks for your feedback, guys. Really happy. Now, why would we implement this farm, uh, error handling in FileMaker? Now, this is actually something I have seen not just once in different projects, and I call, call it the halt optimism. There's a script, I see some kind of a validation, can I go on? No, hold. Now that clearly is problematic. Okay. FileMaker being um, context dependent forces us many times to open what we call internal windows, you know, screens outside of uh, your uh, desktop area, we do some operations there, we close that win those windows. If you just hold, you leave the user in an incoherent status. They probably have focused in a uh, window that is outside of your screen. They have no idea what to do. And often they just have to uh, kill FileMaker and start all over again. So the most important uh, aspect of error handling in FileMaker would be, or at least I would argue, argue is bringing user to a workable state after things go wrong in your script. Okay. The other uh, argument, of course, this kind of error handling is a proven concept. So why not uh, have it in FileMaker? So this was error handling 1.0 was our first go at this problematic. And uh, that was actually uh, implemented very similar in, in a very similar way as uh, mentioned here. Every time we used a perform script, we needed to follow it with uh, an error catcher is then an error and so on. Let me just walk you through what we did here. Every time a script is called the first time, it can see that in the start process section. It's very simple. Whenever we start a process, we make a global variable process, and that global variable lives throughout the whole execution of the script. So whenever a script starts, it looks, do I have the global variable? If yes, then it knows I'm another process starter. I'm not going to do anything with the process. If it uh, doesn't see any process global variable, it says, 
okay, I'm the uh, process starter. Actually, the start process section returns uh, a Boolean variable into the starter script and things go on. Now, when we encountered here, and it could, be, could have been also uh, in su subscripts, I have made it the diagram simple, but uh, it was in sub uh, possible to, it worked in subscripts the same way. When we encountered a situation where we couldn't go on, we called a terminate process, which pretty much uh, out of the box brought the application back to the uh, status it started in. Okay. And a hold followed, obviously. If we wanted to have a custom error handling, so a script written specifically for that situation, we designed a custom error handler and we needed to call it right at the place where the problematic situ situation occurred. Uh, the error handler, the uh, custom error handler could say, okay, well, situation has been uh, rectified, we can go on or we needed to hold. And then a closed process uh, had to follow, which pretty much in case it was a subscript, did nothing. If it was the first script, it deleted the global variable. Obviously, uh, one of the disadvantages um, before every exit script, we needed to uh, make sure that the process is closed in case uh, we are in the starter. So anytime the developer wanted to uh, do exit script, they needed to add an extra script call before that. And the custom error handler needed to be invoked at the place where the problem occurred. We had no way to say, okay, from now on, anything that goes wrong needs to be handled by a specific another custom handler and that would be, get executed when an error happened even in subscripts we didn't have that way or we didn't think of one it's also a possible way to put it when my uh file maker introduced perform script by name things have changed okay. we have realized that we can get rid of this necessity to, to clean up after a process. So what we did, um, yeah, as, as most of you probably, we have a template script. We always copy that to start a new script. So starting a process is automatically included in the template. The problem was exiting the script that needed always to be uh, prepended with our uh, cleanup uh, procedure. What we do now when we start a script and the script realizes it is a process starter, it calls the start process section. That section does all that is necessary. It reads the current uh, application status. It creates that uh, global variable. And yeah, what I have forgotten to mention, in this start process script, the process starter has received, ha, uh, receives the name or ID actually of the script that's, uh, that is its caller. So after doing all of what I have said, the process starter calls the initial script again, this by name. So now in the call stack, we have three scripts and the real execution of the business logic starts up. The second time the script one gets a pass, it sees the process is running and it just uh, goes on. Again, when we encountered an error, uh, we call check error in K and uh, this, yeah, what I'm describing now is uh, a standard uh, error handler invocation when we don't have any custom error handling processes. You call up uh, the error check script. It determines, okay, there is an error. We need to terminate and hold uh, follows. Now, when the first script finishes, 
it transfers uh, the execution back to the process starter. And that one now cleans the process up. So it removes the uh, global variable. This is a great advantage. We don't need to do it in front of the exit script anymore. It's uh, handled automatically. And then the tr tr execution goes back to the first script where exit script follows immediately. Um, I assume if there's anything not clear, you would raise your hand, sure. Good, so what can we do if we want to have a custom error handler? So it's kind of a situation we know it can happen and we already can implement code that handles this kind of error. So everything is uh, goes on as uh, in the first uh, slide. We start a script, initialize process. I made a shortcut here. We go on. And now we decide whatever happens in the following section, we're going to handle with a different script, not our standard error handler that is uh, that automatically deals with all our errors. So we tell the process that we want to register a custom error handler. It's in what it is, in fact is. We give the process global variable a new uh, attribute. Yeah, it's a JSON, of course, uh, stru structure. We give it a new attribute and we say, okay, from now on, this is the active error handler. So when things go wrong, our error checker sees that and it says, all right, let me execute first this custom error handler. That uh, custom error handler does its thing. Uh, if things, if the error is uh, properly handled, it do, uh, does an exit, it clears the error. And one very interesting thing is, if you can here very easily implement a retry mechanism, which actually is not so easy to do with standard try uh, catch finally uh, handling. So if you do that, you can try again what went wrong or uh, that error checker, if it can see that the error has not been cleared after the custom error handler, it invokes again the default error handler, um, process is terminated and um, script is halted. When we're done, we just uh, do unregister error handler, and that is pretty much removing uh, the information about the current error handler from the process global variable. Now, this is not just a simple uh, property, it's actually an array. So we hold a whole stack of custom error handlers, and they are uh, sequentially executed in case there is an error until uh, the error is either resolved or we end up with unresolved error, error and the default error handler gets executed. Okay, let's go on. Just a quick, uh, quick peek into what our terminate process does. We read the, all the information FileMaker can give us about the status of the uh, application. And as the script goes on, we have some other uh, tools to track what happens inside of that, uh, during the execution, I mean. So we trace any window that gets open during execution of a script. And in terminate process, we revert anything we can in these windows and we close them. Then we select this uh, window that was active at the start of the uh, script. We re do a revert there and we restore the toolbars. We restore size, position. We navigate back to the layout that was active uh, in the time of invocation. Uh, window mode, we restore view, zoom. One thing that can't be restored automatically are menu bars, but I'm yet to see an application that during script execution changes uh, menu bars 
in Windows. Are there any questions about the terminate process or anything so far? Um, well, I have question. a question. <laughs> That's a question. David, go for it. <laughs> okay. So does this mean that you be this is kind of the next session as well? Or does this mean that you never commit records during the scripts? No, no, no. Because we do. What's not here on this screen is data. How do you restore the data to the state it was before? Because that's the really problematic thing. The UI user interface, it's nice to restore, but if you've set data that in the end is no longer correct, how do you handle that? Okay. Um, there, the, okay, I have probably forgotten to mention this is our best attempt at turning everything back. Okay, I don't say that we are 100% successful. There are cases where data has been committed and so on, but that's kind of, um, yeah, the way you need to build your application without the error handling the commit would have been there anyway, right? So we are always very aware of the fact that um, our error handler can't rescue you 100%. But in the, I don't know, five, six years we've been using this, I am yet to see a situation where the error handler would do more damage than unhandled script, right? So we are quite confident that this works most of the time. And if you wanna be sure, you need to put more thought into your, uh, the, into the organization of your code. Hmm? I, that's what it is. Does that answer so your- I mean, I mean, to me, yeah, I mean, to me, um, I think I, I really like your approach. I mean, I remember the session you, you presented a few years ago in Berlin when we were meeting in person. I think I have a similar approach, though yours is perhaps a bit more structured. The other thing, uh, and I mean, but to me still, that's the the data issue is really a very fundamental issue. And I know there's no perfect solution. As so. The other thing I've been tending towards lately is to check for success rather than error. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, sorry? what? to check for success rather than error. Check for success. No, we don't kind of do that, but of course uh, every commit that gets executed is considered a success. So yeah, yeah, yeah. not really. Yeah. My question was, um, this relies on uh, having all your scripts or the complete stack within one file. If you call a script in another file um, and an error occurs there. First, your global variables are not available there. And second, um, do you call a script from your external file that resides in the first in the calling file? So do you have references in both ways or do you just call in one direction? Yep. And a plus perform script on server. How does that fit into the uh, exit and then call another script or the, uh, the, the error handler somewhere yeah. else. These are all actually uh, different cases of the same uh, problem. So I'm gonna uh, yeah perform it on server or another file. That's not simple. I absolutely agree. Every other file that gets invoked kind of does its own error handling. Yeah? And we if we know a process or a script from other file will be called, we need to make sure that that script does not execute hold. There's no way around it. I have actually filed a feature request at FileMaker to allow hold return a value. Because in these days, it starts to make much more sense to have hold communicate things back. If you use API, uh, FileMaker API to invoke scripts and you do a halt, your API says I, success and doesn't tell you anything. So if you, I strongly believe we need halt to return value as well. 
And that's exactly but that's the idea. Uh, sorry, the idea of a halt that you just halt and not return. Yeah, right. But clearly, if you do a halt in a, another file, you're out of luck. Hmm. You should, okay, you should halt anything that happens in that file, but that doesn't mean that your execution in the other file, if you can't, due to the fact that the global variables are local to the files, you can't get around it. But that, that's what we do. We make sure no halt is executed. And in the last execute uh, uh, exit script, we pass the whole error object to the calling pro, uh, file. That there, so uh, until now, there has been no other way around that. Okay. Uh, so I have one question as well. Sure. Um, you know, and first, you know, I know David Wickstrom knows very well about transactions, but I think Vince in the next session will be discussing them again, which may, you know, it somewhat addresses the issue of uh, dealing with data and commits uh, in the process of this, right? Is to manage the data and the transactions. Um, but my question is, you know, uh, so I, I like this approach because it, it's independent of the call stack. Um, however, when you're terminating the script, do you have any mechanism for, let's say, alternate actions other than simply halt? You know, if let's say in the context that uh, the script is in, you want an alternative action other than simply terminating the entire uh, script and then logging the error, uh, you know, what sort of, what sort of, uh, you know, how would you deal with that in terms of sort of an alternate action other than simply halting and terminating? You design a script that you call your custom error handler. And in the second step in this diagram, you tell our process from now on, I want any errors to be handled by this script. All right, then your script contains a classical if else if branch. Yeah. If you find your script and you can pass as many information as you want to the, the, the script using the standard error checker, then you're fine. If your error handler does not mediate the error, you get transferred into the default error handler that does your termination. So, um, uh, okay, so error handler one, error handler two, you have alternate error handlers That's for that situation. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Okay. So, so kind of like different question, have a looked at uh, using set error logging off the log file that FileMaker now can create on the client? Sorry? FileMaker introduced a couple of versions ago this set error logging on that creates a log file of an error on the yeah. user side in the, in the doc. Did you look at that? We haven't gotten into implementing that into our logging, uh, into our error handling procedures so far because we actually do our logging uh, on our own. We already had a logging table and anything that happens gets logged into that table. So yeah, few technical details. We never put set error capture on to the start of our scripts. We do that only in a very specific situations, uh, in very specific situations where we accept, expect things to go wrong and we use our own error handling to do that. Uh, all the communication with process and error is wrapped around in custom functions. We do not speak to the global variables directly. We have everything uh, through custom functions. And yeah, we also use uh, tools like uh, custom functions in names of windows that uh, get open, for instance, to track opening of those windows. And so we can build, uh, get the info. There are, would be other ways, of course, but we know exactly which window is now open. What um, I haven't put into this, this presentation, we have used with kind of decent success our um, error uh, handling mechanism to and the process mechanism, namely, to uh, 
deal with some nasty behavior on Windows. If you start a script on Windows, you open an internal window and user has got two windows open at a time. If they, during the execution of your script, click into the other window that was active at the time of started, or startup of the script, after your script finishes, the other window gets active. So your script does, uh, is suddenly in a window it was not in when it started. And the script has no way of uh, knowing that. So what we did, we track the Z order of windows and every time a window gets closed, we uh, explicitly select the next window that should be uh, selected according to the Z order. And we have been able to use uh, this quite uh, yeah, successfully. Now, I'm going to do a short demonstration. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share the file with you because uh, it's been, yeah, there's a lot of uh, stuff in there and it would probably mean uh, many support questions for us. There is a good chance we will provide, we will make an add on that will just deal with the error handling and process handling out of. Uh, yeah, what I'm going to show you now, because this is a complete uh, FileMaker uh, library that we use as a startup file for every project. So, yeah, bear with me. I'm going to open up my file. 15 minutes left, Jan. Yep, thank you. Wait, I want to be here. No. So, um, can you see my screen very well? Wait, I was actually, I planned to make my resolution sm uh, smaller. Is that okay? Is it okay like this or should I make my screen smaller? Okay, yeah. Yep, let's start. I, I can always switch later if things go wrong. So, I made a very basic uh, stuff. This is a project co uh, consists of several project lines. When you want to finish a project, there is a, a script that takes item after item and uh, calls a script to finish that item. And at the end, the mm, whole project gets finished. Now, my users can open different items. And uh, yeah, another one. Voila. So I've got two items here now. And uh, I start editing this one. And then I click on finish. Our standard L error handler has acted. My script will design in such a way to make sure nothing uh, that we succeeded in changing the first item from the uh, or actually any item from the context of the first window and it has failed now we have built this standard error handling dialog with uh, a very neat feature uh, if you are uh, if you have full access account you get to see the debug button you can click it you open your screw debugger and you see perfectly what's going on here. Now, this is a good example of what I was talking about for the process. That's the starting script. And you see that right now it's active on the process start item. The process start is actually calling by name the startup script again. And in the next instance, we are already um, inside the loop that uh, deals with uh, um, finishing the individual project items. 
And inside of that script, we ran to a situation that uh, couldn't be resolved. Now, what you can see here, we use a lot of um, custom functions that actually do not return results. They use the let statement to create error objects. So in this line, our error uh, check script was called because we expected that the line above could possibly bring problems. And we have used the calculation engine of uh, the, the calculation section of the perform script to actually create that error with the uh, error new function. I will show you what the process looks like. Well, actually, no, I'm not going to show you like this. I'm going to show you like that. Voila. So this is information about the process. All we could get up. And when I, if, if I just clicked on OK in my, uh, in the first dialog, it would just turn, uh, read all this information, turn it back, and we would be pretty much good to go in the same, the application is in the same status that it was when the script started. Another view, the error is already cleaned. Yes, that's true, because here our default error handler executes the clear here. But so from now on, what you can do is uh, pretty much, yeah, we are here, resume. So as a developer, I can now go on, go on here. Yeah, exit from here because that's uh, the error check. Perfect. And I'm back here. I can go here and see, hey, why is this uh, not working? Okay, well, and I can perfectly test whatever, whatever goes wrong here. All right, let's uh, close this. Yep. I don't think I can move here. I can move the window just to show you what happens. Well, window is back where it was. Now, okay. I have written a custom error handler for this situation. So let me show you uh, what this custom error handler does for me. I'm just gonna use, it's a copy of the first screen with a custom error handler because I know these things can happen. So again, I'm gonna modify it and I'm gonna try to finish this, uh, the pro uh, project. We have uh, been able to determine that uh, the project item, item 11 in window named project item is not committed. And we can ask the user, hey, what do you want? Now, my custom error handler, handler is written in such a way that I can commit, uh, reject the changes. Yeah, okay, revert, I sorry for the warning. Or I can, the users can say, hey, uh, what's going on? I got no idea. And if I do that, our standard uh, error handler kicks in. So let's just, um, yeah, let's um, confirm, voila, and everything went went fine. Now, I'm gonna show you this. Is this code, if anyone has problems um, following the code, please let me know. I'm gonna make this uh, screen smaller. I'm gonna change the resolution. But what, uh, okay, this is all not important. All right, so what, what I did here, this is the script to finish a project. Yeah, as you can see, we do a lot of stuff like open record. In fact, I have put here open record uh, script step, but we don't do that. We are using, um, scripts for a lot of stuff that uh, can go wrong. So we have, for instance, a script record open that, and I've heard that uh, from other people here as well, that's a loop that just go, does record, uh, open record, record. If that goes wrong, 
It tries several times with a small pause in between the attempts and only if that fails at the end, then here an error gets generated. Okay. And this again gets caught by either custom error handler or the standard error handler. So what's going on here? This is standard business logic. I'm simply going to loop through all my project items. But I'm, uh, wait, that's the wrong one. Sorry, my bad. Let me close this and close this. It was closed before. I don't know why it got open now. Right. So we're looping through the uh, items. And here I'm telling the system, okay, if things go wrong, you invoke um, the script with ID 481. Um, you can see IDs of your scripts either uh, with MBS plugin or if you get, um, sorry, database design report, then it shows the IDs of your scripts as well, right? And then things go, this is the same uh, procedure, uh, the, the same script that was called in the first case. It doesn't need to know anything about who handles the script, in fact. It just tries to set a field to true, and if things go, go wrong, it calls the error. And I'm gonna show you how it's done. So the first the custom function actually creates that error. The first parameter is a number. Uh, all FileMaker uh, error numbers are uh, handled by our standard error handler, and we can add our own custom error numbers. And uh, with the second function call, we add a property to specify the ID of the project item that we need to need, we need handle. And I'm going to right away show you why we do that. Because here is that error handler. And there's a first lot of uh, generic stuff. We actually open up all the properties, standard properties of the error into local variables. And plus here, we read ID of the project item. And yep. if... Sorry, to interrupt. Five minutes left. Yes, I know. I'm, all, I'm almost done. If the error is 301, which from experience we know is the problem with uh, the record being locked, then we know we can try to do something, right? And we look for all other open windows. And if we find a window with the same context as with the context of a project item, where the record is in open state and when the ID of the record is the same one as with the record, we know we have found our culprit. We show the dialog, we react uh, according to the user's response, and we just say, all right, in the case the user has chosen com uh, commit or revert, we uh, actually, yep, we give here the retry command back in the exit script, and uh, we say that the error has been cleared. That's here. You can see uh, clear error. If we don't go through this uh, branch, we just do exit script, and the standard error handling will throw us into the default error handler. Now, I'm actually quite surprised that it. Uh, I managed to speak for such a long time. I thought I'd be finished um, a bit sooner. So. Please, guys, if you have any questions, fire up. I'm all yours. Um, so a question. Uh, so you do this just to be able to do the uh, try catch and then to do retry. So uh, uh, the, in this way, you don't have to go back in uh, to the, the chain all the way up, but uh, you can uh, take care of the error. And then if possible, you can uh, keep on with the code if you got a, a positive. Yes, uh, as, 
as you have seen here in my heart, these are all open again. I hate it. I have closed them just now. This is the script that performs finish on an individual project item, right? So it is explicitly put into a loop where here is an attempt to set the item to finished. And then the error check is called. And here we have an attempt to see whether the error handler has told us to retry. And if not, we just jump out of the loop. And but the, as I was said in the um, in the presentation, this is an explicit contract between your business code and your custom error handler. There is no mechanism built in into our standard error handling to facilitate this. You have to completely design your custom error handler to do this and your script to be able to react to this response. Yeah. Okay. So how many times do we execute this script in an average solution? How many times, sorry? I... Yeah, how, many, how often do you execute the, the uh, error check script in a normal script? Like after every set field, after every commit? Yeah, after... yeah. Um, what I can show you, we have actually, uh, not in templates, here are some templates that they, for instance, yeah, I'm going to show you our standard script. Huh? This is how all our, all our scripts start. Hmm. First, uh, we have uh, yeah, some co comments and so on. Here is a piece that deals with parameters. We always comment them out. So we can get our parameters. And here are some validations. So we have actually a validation system to check where a parameter is empty or where if, if we want it to be a member of certain value list, then the second validation does that for us. And this custom function creates an error object. Again, it's a global variable in case one of the conditions are not met. And then right after we just call uh, error check. That's, that's it. Other things that we always check is context if necessary. So again, error check. And in the calculation part, we call a function that creates an error if the context is not uh, compliant with a field that we put here as a parameter. Similar for uh, layout check. We actually, we have custom functions that allow us to work with script IDs and layout ID, IDs. So we can identify those to our environment using all of that. Again, error if the layout is not what it should be. We have for window mode check the same, and we have for interactivity check, which is sometimes quite important. Uh, an interactive uh, script in our concept is one that will require user input. And we often mm, write code indeed specific based on that. Oh, well, and then it's just uh, go on. For we have some other, if I can, if I show you, yeah, all those try to commit. Yeah, a lot of, uh, we actually build the whole tree. And at the end, if we, if we have had get last error, giving us a value, we call this. Uh, yeah. We call the error check script. Again, record uh, open check script. Pretty much all of these scripts that you will find here are there to provide us with uh, an encapsulated way to uh, throw errors in case they happen. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So then back to your session, when you have your add-on that you throw into the existing solution, how do you make these two work together? If you have an add-on with a very stripped down kind of coding. Yeah, that was exactly the point in my last slide yesterday. You need to let loose of all this stuff if you want to keep the footprint of your add-on smaller. 
But and it seems difficult. I mean, I really like this approach, even though, once again, I don't take it quite as far, but I, I'm basically, I really like it a lot. So how, how do you let it go? Well, we, we try to, to throw the error handling out of the add-ons and not to bother the target database with all our uh, internal add-on and framework stuff. But yeah, that means that you need to thoroughly test the functionality of our add-on, uh, of your add-on, of course. So your internal add-ons do contain references to these scripts or if you have add-ons just for your internal use or you don't use add-ons for your own internal use only? Well, good question. There's an, an issue with add-ons reusing certain things like custom functions, but not reusing uh, other mm -hmm. things uh, like scripts and so on. So exactly. once we have crystallized functionality that has proven its worth and, and has been used for several years, uh, and we make an add-on out of it, then we, we leave all the error handling out of it to keep it as small as possible and uh, not to interfere with ex existing functionality in the target system. Because the thing that I, I kind of always struggle with is that I do error handling against myself and against my clients, if you like. Like there's development errors, developer errors that, I mean, we all make. And then there are just like facts of the state of the data that are errors. So do you, do you, is this like mainly because like you put the button in the wrong context and then it should detect that? Or is it like the state of the data was wrong? Do you differentiate between these two categories of errors at all or not? Most of the errors that we treat and that actually have helped us in the in the past to reduce development and testing time were indeed more of the types like a button in wrong context used and so on. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to data consistency and data uh, integrity, you once you start delve into that, you realize that it's very hard to make some generic approach to that. You just you just need to script around that uh, on on a need basis. You can't generalize that. Okay, that yeah. I I'd like to add one comment to this in general in the community, and this is something that uh, we've went down this road one time where it's like you just. Uh, everything was just error checked. Uh, the problem that I have with that from um, a code uh, uh, supporting perspective, it just gets too bloated. And I, 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 a long time ago, I took a Java class and uh, you know, there is this concept in Java where you turn on debug mode and you're logging the steps, every one of them, how long to take, or not the steps, but the execution of the code right? So that you can look at the debug log and see like if, if it's surfacing any errors, right? So I agree that we should have error checking for business logic, but I, I think it goes too far sometimes with a lot of people where it's like, um, oh, this field is missing uh, or this layout's not there. Do I check for the layout? Do I check for go to related records? Do I check for like <laughs> your code becomes so bloated, you cannot no longer see the logic of your code because you've got so much error checking everywhere. Um, it's not elegant. And I wish FileMaker, like I, I, I mean, Claris, uh, you know, like it's it's been a longstanding request where the event log or the error log or whatever the thing is that logs the errors that scripts get it's only for certain air engines. It's not for all of them. So like if you've got a client and it runs scripts, none of those errors are captured in, in one place. So I, I would love for them to really get like, you know, some understanding that your, your FileMaker Go or your FileMaker Pro or, you know, the, the data API or whatever, all the errors in scripting engines anywhere they log the errors in one place. Sorry, that's my rant, I apologize. Well, yeah, but I have to tell you that we actually managed to keep it quite low on the overhead. And the reason is that we do not um, use that, uh, what was it, set error capture on. So anywhere 
We do not expect things go wrong. Like when layout gets deleted, that's no, we're not going to do check error after every go to layout. FileMaker will do that for us. And I mean, as I've said, our procedures are an attempt to go as cleanly back as possible. But I mean, we're still better off than doing nothing. And we leave a lot of stuff to FileMaker. Why not? You don't need to check everything. But when you know things go wrong, you can do that. Huh? Like wrong parameters in your script automatically handled. I mean, if you know how many times we have uh, discovered immediately a button that got copied and someone forgot to modify the, uh, the parameters in the, of, inside the definition of the button, the script that uh, they have written uh, again immediately told them, sorry, no parameters. And one other thing that I forgot to mention, we aim to provide solutions that are already tested. Our customers almost never get to see those error handlers. These, these are mostly for us to make sure that our application runs as smooth as possible. And if they go wrong anyway, as you can see, I've got here a perfect uh, two records of errors that have happened during my demonst demonstration. And I can find pretty much everything there. This is the whole error object. So, so I mean, it has got advantages. I definitely argue, I'm gonna argue that. You, you can't error check everything. You would go crazy indeed. Mm -hmm.